you got your Bibles, go ahead and turn to 2 Kings chapter 6. 2 Kings chapter 6. If you don't own a Bible, um, I highly recommend the YouVersion app. It's a free app on any smartphone, mobile device. You can download it even right now in church. That's okay. It has all kinds of different translations. It's a wonderful app. So while you're going to 2 Kings 6, I want to tell you a story about a father and a son. And the son was getting ready to graduate from high school. And as the tradition was in that neighborhood, that time was a pretty affluent kind of neighborhood. And what the tradition was is that the father would buy the child a brand new car for the graduation present, kind of a rite of passage. And so as the days became closer to the graduation, the father took the son um, around to the different car dealerships and tried to pick out the most perfect car they could find. And they finally found the right one. And so graduation day came and the, the son was pretty excited about this. And uh, the father went to give him his present. And it was a small gift wrap box. And the boy was a little bit confused when he saw this box gift wrap. And he, he opened it up. And inside he found a brand new Bible with the son's name embossed on the front. And the father said, happy graduation, son. And the son was just furious. He was angry. He said, dad, I can't believe you did this to me. I can't believe this is what you gave me for a graduation present. And in anger and frustration, he threw the Bible down and walked out of the house and never came back to the father. Until one day he received a phone call that his dad had passed away. And he thought for one more time, I'm gonna go back home and I'm gonna pay my final respects to my father. And after the funeral, he went up to his father's office, going through his stuff, opened a drawer where he found that Bible that so many years ago had destroyed their relationship. And he remembers the anger and the frustration of that day. And so he decided to go ahead and open up that Bible for the first time. And on the inside of that cover, he found a check with the date of that graduation date for the exact amount of money for that new car that they had picked. Now, why do I tell you that story? Because I think some of us might believe that the greatest tragedy was the fact that the son never opened the Bible. I disagree. I don't think that's the greatest tragedy of that story. Now, I've been told that's actually a true story. I don't know if that's true. I can't confirm that. But here's what I'm going to tell you. The saddest part was not the fact that that son didn't open the Bible. The saddest fact about that story is that son missed how much his dad loved him. And friends, if you're a first-time guest, I just want to say welcome. I'm glad that you guys are here with us today. We have been on a journey as a church called 40 Days in the Word. And we've been walking through God's Word together in community. And so where I'm going with this is we've talked about how there's three things we want to do with God's Word. The first thing we want to do is we want to learn it. We want to get it in our head. We want to understand how do I read the Bible? What does that look like? And throughout this series, we've done that. It, again, if you've missed a week, please go to our website, Nathan.Church. We also have a YouTube channel that you can go to and you can, you can watch the past messages where we've talked about those different things in God's Word. But we really want you to love God's Word. We want you to fall in love with it. I, I don't read it because I'm a pastor. I don't read God's Word because I'm a follower of Jesus Christ and that's what you're supposed to do. I read this because I want to know how much my dad loves me. And I want to find out day after day how much more I can grow and be like him. Because the last thing we want to do is we want to live out God's word. We want to be the hands and feet of Jesus. And I want to tell you something. I, um, this year is kind of a significant year for me. Um, this is the fifth year that I've been in ministry. I was called into ministry first as a children's pastor in Sioux Falls and Celebrate Church. I served in that role for three years. And now this coming uh, July was when two years when my wife and I moved to Yankton and started this journey to plant the church. And, and where I'm going with this is because when we're talking about God's word and 40 days in the word, I want you to hear this from the bottom of my heart. I am not trying to get you to do something. Please hear that. I, I know we're all busy. We all have lots of things going on. And I don't say you need to be in God's word because I want you to have something else to do. Because here's what I'm telling you. There have been, on this journey, 19 people that have been committed to this. And I've said, yes, I want to do that. I talked to my life group host and I said, hey, give me the numbers. How, how is this going? What's this doing? Like 19 people. Praise God for that. Isn't that awesome? 19 people have said on this journey, I'm going to be committed to this. I'm going to be following God's word. I'm going to be doing that. 
And I'm excited about that. And it excites me not for the reasons maybe that you think I might be excited for that. This is why this excites me, is because I understand something from being a pastor. Not too many people call the church and say, hey, I just wanted to let you know, today's going great, it's awesome, I'm just calling to let you know that, okay? That's not what the kind of calls that I get as a pastor. Over the last five years, here are the kind of calls that I get as a pastor. I get the call where I say, my spouse just left me and I don't know what to do. I get the kind of calls where we just lost my child. I, I get the kind of calls where, where people say, I just lost my job, I don't know where I'm gonna turn to, I don't know what, what hope I have. Or I get those kind of calls where the doctor said it's cancer. And, and, and I don't have much time left to live. So when I, what jacks me up about the fact when we say that there's 19 people that are committed to reading God's word, here's what I say. It gets me excited because this is the solid rock that we stand on. Amen. And in those moments and in those times, because friends, I'm here to tell you, I love you and I love you as your pastor. The storm in your life is coming. You're either coming out of a storm, you're in a storm right now, or there is a storm coming. Storms in this life will happen. And where do you cling to? This is where I cling to. I'm Christ, the solid rock I stand. All other ground is. Amen. That's what excites me about this. So I want to tell you something here today. I know it's kind of a heavy way to start, so let me lighten it back up a little bit. All right? That's a heavy way to go. But here's what I'm going to tell you. I think there might be a tendency to look at God's word still and say, I don't understand it, Pastor. I, I really want to. I really, and I've had conversations like this. Where, Pastor, I really, I want to get in God's Word, and I try it, and I look at it, and I just don't get it. It's just not connecting for me. And if that is you here today, welcome home. We are glad that you are here, and I'm going to give you what I think is, the, I'm calling it the golden key. If you get this, and you understand this, it is going to unlock God's Word in a way that you could never possibly understand and fathom. So I'm, I'm going to give this to you, okay? So we're in 2 Kings chapter 6. And um, before we get into this passage, I'm going to kind of set it up for you a little bit. Um, there is a king of a country called Aram. And Aram, the king of Aram decided he was going to go attack the nation of Israel. That's God's chosen people, the nation of Israel. And just like any king that was going to be invading a nation, he would look for the weakest spot in the country, and he would try to attack there. Here's the problem. Every time he would make a plan... And every time he would go and try to attack the Israelites right there, guess what? They were there, they were ready, and they were prepared, and they would defeat the king and send the king back losing. This happened time and time again. It happened so many times that the king actually, the king of Aram got frustrated. And he said, there must be a spy in our midst. Somebody is telling Israel where we're going, and they're forewarning them, i got to find out who this spy is. So he called all of his officials together, and he said, who is it? that is telling the king of Israel where I'm trying to attack. And the officials told this king, he said, Oh no, king, there is no spy among us, but there is a man of God in the nation of Israel, and his name is Elisha. And God is telling Elisha where you are going to attack, king. And then Elisha is telling the king of Israel, so he's prepared for you every time. So we're going to pick it up in verse 13. And this is what the king says. When he hears this report, go find out where Elisha is, the king ordered, so I can send men to capture him. The report came back. He is in Dothan. Then he sent horses and chariots and a strong force there. They went by night and surrounded the city. When Elisha's servant got up and went out early the next morning, he saw an army with horses and chariots surrounded the city. I want to stop right there. Think about that when you get up in the morning, right? Anybody have morning brain when they wake up in the morning? It's just me, right? Kind of like, mm, looking up, looking around. And I can just see the server kind of looking out the window. And like, freaking out, right? And he's like, oh no, there's this army that's surrounding us. So this is what he says to Elisha. He says, oh no, my Lord, what shall we do? The servant asked. This is what Elisha said to his servant. Don't be afraid, he answered. Those who are with us, are more than those who are with them. To which I would say, what? If I'm the servant, let's do the math here. One, two. One, two. Me and Elisha, right? 
And there's an army out there. This is a vast army. Uh, studies to tell us it's probably between two to 10,000 people. This was not just a small force. They surrounded this city. How could Elisha say there is more with us than is with them? And I'm telling you, it is the golden key that is gonna unlock God's word for someone in this room today. And here's what it is. I'm gonna give it to you in verse 17. Elisha prayed. Open his eyes, Lord, so that he may see. Open his eyes, Lord, so that he may see. Friends, we don't always see things from a spiritual standpoint. We don't always see, we see the physical world around us. We see the things around us. We don't always see with those spiritual eyes. And the Lord opened the eyes of the servant, and he looked and saw the hills full of horses and chariots and fire all around Elisha. Light illuminates the darkness. And friends, I'm telling you, if, if, if we're having trouble reading God's word, if, if when you look at God's word, sometimes you read it, and it feels like Charlie Brown teacher, you know what I'm talking about, where all the adults in Charlie Brown are wah, 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 I just don't get it, all right? This is what we need to do. We need to have spiritual eyes. So if you got your notes, I'm going to give you two facts about spiritual eyes, and then we're going to walk through what this golden key is. So here's the first one. Your God is greater than your problem. I'm going to say that one more time. Your God is greater than your problem. See, Elisha knew it didn't matter how many soldiers are surrounding the city. My God is bigger than that. It doesn't matter how big a problem that I'm facing. My God is bigger than that. Friends, I'm here to tell you today. I don't know what army you're facing right now. I don't know your struggle. I don't know the pain that you're going through. But my God is bigger than that. God is greater than our problems. But here's the second one that I think is the easy one to miss sometimes. Your growth will depend on your gaze. Your growth will depend on your gaze. What you see is what you get, what you look at. All the servants saw was this massive army. And don't forget, I want to think about this for a second. This servant was with Elisha every time that Elisha had predicted where the king was going to attack. Remember that? He knew every time when the king was going to come. Now, again, if I were the servant, I might have said to Elisha, really? You didn't see this one coming? All these other times, Elisha, whenever the king was going to attack, you would have the presence of mind to tell, know what it is, go and tell the king and warn him. But this one, now look what we're going to do. Where's your God now, Elisha? How many times have we said that to God? Or we look at a problem and we say, oh, I can't get through this. What are we going to do with that? How, 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 God, God, how could you allow this to happen to me? Anybody ever been there before? I know I have. Here's what I'm going to tell you about that. Again, I, your God is bigger than your problem. But here's what I'm going to say. We serve a good God. God loves us. He wants what's best for us. He's here to protect us. But we live in a sinful and fallen and broken world where sometimes bad things happen to good people. And I don't know the answer why. I wish I did sometimes. Sometimes when I hear things happen, I'm just like, God, I don't get that. I don't understand why. And I think the servant might be thinking that in this situation. And if you've ever felt that way, I want you to know that's okay. But I want you to know something. Nothing has ever crossed the desk of God without his approval. God doesn't cause it, but definitely God signs off on it. And, and we want to make sure to say, listen, I don't know the reason why. And maybe what God was saying here was maybe God was saying, listen, I need the servant to be able to depend on me. I need him to see what these spiritual eyes. I want to open that. I'm not sure. But our growth will depend on our gaze. Whatever struggle you're facing, you have a choice. You can either focus on the problem or you can focus on your God. And if we choose to focus on our God, he is never going to fail us. So here's what we're going to talk about. I want you guys to know that the same power, that light that shined on Elisha's servant, I want you to hear something today. It is available to us today in this room. Amen. That exact same light that God used to illuminate for Elisha and his servant is available to us here today. And I'm going to walk you through what that looks like. So but before we do that, I have a question for you. How many people in this room would like it if Jesus was right here in this room? Now, I know I realize Jesus is everywhere, but I'm saying the actual physical presence of Jesus standing right here, how many of you would think that would be a really cool thing? We'd like to see that, right? Can I tell you something? I don't. I don't hope Jesus to be here for two reasons. One, if Jesus is here, that means game over. 
And there's some people that I know that will be separated from God. I'm not okay with that. Here's the second reason why I'm glad that Jesus is in here. It's because Jesus said it's actually better if I'm not there. Did you know that? If you go back to last week, we talked about the conversation Jesus had with his disciples as he was getting ready to leave planet Earth. And we're going to put it up on the screen here. It's John 14, 26. And Jesus said, but the advocate, the Holy Spirit, whom the Father will send in my name, will teach you all things and will remind you of everything I have said to you. Jesus said, it's actually better that I go away because I'm going to send the Holy Spirit to you. Now, again, if you're new to church and this is a new concept, you want to back up just for a second. There's one God. We believe in one God who is all powerful, all present and all knowing. My little human brain has a hard time with that and a hard time wrapping around that. So what God has done is God has presented himself in three different persons. There's God the Father. When we talk about God, that's the one we usually think about. God the Father, the one in heaven, over everything. Then there's God the Son. That would be Jesus, right? The physical representation of God came down in earth in human flesh. But the third part of that is God the Spirit, the Holy Spirit. I always call it kind of the forgotten part of the Trinity. You don't hear a lot about the Holy Spirit a lot of times. When I was little, we used to call it the Holy Ghost. Anybody ever call it the Holy Ghost before? Right? To me, it was kind of scary, right? Holy Ghost, it's kind of scary. Is it Casper, you know, is he in my closet? I don't know, what's this Holy Spirit thing? Well, I'm gonna help you with that. So before Jesus came to the earth, the Holy Spirit was given to certain people at certain times for a certain purpose. I'm going to say that one more time. It was given to certain people at certain times for a certain purpose. For like an example, Elisha. Elisha had the Holy Spirit. It came on him. The servant had it. He could see with spiritual eyes. Then Jesus came. And, and there's a reason for that. And I'll get to that in a second. But after Jesus came and Jesus took the penalty for our sin, he died on the cross. We're getting ready to celebrate that this next week. When he rose from the dead, he said, I'm going to go away. And God's spirit is going to come to you. And this was actually prophesied way before Jesus that instead of being available for certain people at certain times for a certain purpose, God's spirit was now going to be available to all people at all times for the purpose of drawing them closer to God. Do you understand the power of that? Did you know that you have the power of the Holy Spirit if you're a follower of Jesus Christ? The same spirit that raised Jesus from the dead can be alive inside of you. How cool is that? That's awesome. And one of the jobs of the Holy Spirit is to illuminate God's word. It's supposed to help us understand, teach things, and interpret things in the Bible that we couldn't understand on our own. That's how the Holy Spirit can shine a light. So today I'm going to kind of teach you there's three things that you really need to know to see with spiritual eyes. So to, in a sense, have the Holy Spirit and that power within you. So if you got your notes, we're going to talk about the first one here. And the first one is, I must choose Jesus. I must choose Jesus. Jesus said this in John 14, 6. He said, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No one comes to the Father except through me. If you want to put this another way, until you surrender your life to Christ, you are spiritually blind. Now, I'm going to make a statement, and I mean this in love. So many people believe because they come to church, that means they're a follower of Jesus Christ. And I want to help you with that. That's not true. There's so many people. It, it, the same thing as saying, because I'm in a garage, I must be a car. All right? It doesn't make any sense. In order to be a follower of Jesus Christ, you have to actually make that decision that I am going to commit my life to Christ. I'm going to surrender my will, my wants, and my desires, and I'm going to surrender to Jesus Christ. Many of us don't actually do that. And I think there's one reason why. And that's the word called pride. Pride is one of the greatest original sins, and we still suffer from it. We suffer from it and say, I know more than you, God. God, I know more than you. How many of you, when you were uh, uh, growing up, thought you knew more than your parents? Anybody? All right. I'm a parent of two teenage boys right now, and I don't have their permission to share any stories, but I'm just going to say that, all right? I'm going to let your minds go and understand the fact that I'm probably the dumbest human being on earth right now. I'm just going to say it like that, okay? Can I say it like that? And it's pride. We have that pride, that's a natural desire in us to think that we know more than God and we don't want to surrender that. And can I tell you something? There is an enemy out there that hates you, hates your family, hates your marriage, hates your life, 
And he wants you to stand on your pride. He wants you to lean on your own understanding and fall flat on the face in the face of Jesus. But until we choose to trust Jesus, we are blind, just like Elisha's servants, and our problems can overwhelm us. In John 3, Jesus said this, Very truly I tell you, no one can see the kingdom of God unless they are born again. That renewal and that rebirth is something that's really cool and that can happen. And I'm going to tell you something, friends. When we start talking about Easter, this is what just gets me so fired up and so emotional. Because we're, we're in a battle. Not one person in this room is guaranteed tomorrow. I just had this happen this last week where there was a, a couple that I'm familiar with and connected to. And she was 50 years old and she died just like that last Sunday. 50 years old. She's gone. And it just breaks your heart. And, and, and I just want to say this again. Like Sometimes I get frustrated with people who follow Jesus Christ and they're like, oh, isn't it so great? She's in heaven. It's not great. Yes, we have the hope of Jesus Christ. Yes, we know we're going to see her again. And we can hold that promise. But can I tell you something that sucks for her husband right now? It really does. It stinks for him. He's suffering. He's in pain. And that hurt is never going to go away. And I think as Christians, sometimes we need to understand and recognize that death still stings. And it still hurts. And it's still okay to cry. My Savior stood outside the tomb of one of his best friends. And in the next paragraph, he was going to raise him from the dead. And the Bible said he wept. And I'm not talking like those little tears that you cry sympathy. Like it was a deep, gut-wrenching wailing. So much so that the people who were watching him said, look at how he loved him. Friends, if my Savior can mourn like that, I think we need to do that too. And I think we need to understand the fact that it's okay not to be okay sometimes. And, and my whole point in saying all that is life is brief. It is short and it can be over like that. And we need to live with a sense of urgency that that is a big deal and that matters to God. And, and, and maybe there's someone in your life where you're not sure. I had that before in my life where there's somebody like, I'm not really sure if they're Christian or not. And they're kind of like, sometimes maybe, sometimes maybe not. Can I help you with that? You need to have that conversation. You need to just go ahead and put it out there. And it, it might offend them. It might put them on the defense. Please, please don't, please don't do it from a judgmental heart. Do it from a, do it from a sympathetic heart. Just to say, hey, if you were to die tonight, how, how are you with that? Are you okay with that? Can, can we talk about that? Because that's what we need to understand. Because that's the seriousness. My Bible says that many people on that day will say, Lord, Lord, didn't I do this? And Jesus said, depart from me, I never knew you. That's a scary verse, guys. We need to always make sure we can never take for granted if somebody is a follower of Jesus Christ or not. Because that's the first step in being filled with the Holy Spirit and understanding that. Here's the second one. I must be clean. I must be clean. Matthew 5, 8, Jesus is talking. He said, blessed are the pure in heart, for they will see God. Now, I need to help you something. Being pure doesn't mean you have to be perfect, okay? So if you're sitting here today thinking, man, I'm, I've blown that, it's not going to happen. No. Welcome home. We're, we're all in the same boat here. What it means to be pure is that I don't want to have anything between me and God. As you continue to grow, as you continue to mature in your faith, God is going to reveal more and more things in your life that aren't okay. And he's going to say, listen, when that happens, you need to take care of that. You need to change that. Another way to say it is, I don't want to let the garbage pile up in my life. For example, if I'm saying to God, God, I want your guidance. God, I want your direction. God, reveal to me your plan in this area. But yet, I'm looking at things on my phone that I know I shouldn't be looking at. If I'm looking at images or, or pictures or videos that aren't pure, that don't bring God glory, that are, that are trash, for lack of a better term, God can't help me with that. I'm allowing junk to pile up in my life. Or, how about this one? If I'm holding bitterness or resentment towards someone else. If, 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 if Elaine and I aren't okay, if my wife and I have problems, I need to take care of that first. I need to go to her and I need to say, hey, honey, I need to talk to you about this. I need, I need to make that right. Anytime there's distance between you and someone else, you need to take care of that. It's our responsibility. The ball is always in our court. Now, I understand we cannot control other people. I totally get that. And just because you go to somebody and you say, hey, I need to talk to you, they might respond in a negative way. That's not on you. That's on them. But we need to try everything we can to do that. How about jealousy? 
This is one that I think is huge. Where we can look at someone else and we can do one of two things. We can either tear them down and say, well, sure, I would, if I could, right? Or we look at them and say, man, I can never be that good. Jeez, I, I would never be able to do that. That takes two forms. And can I help you with that? Both of those are sin. God made you exactly the way he wanted to make you. If God would have wanted you a different way, he would have made you that way. We need to be who we are, and our identity needs to be firm in Christ. Because when we start looking at other people and comparing it, that's sin. And God can't help us with that when we have that. Hey, look at 1 John 2.11. Anyone who hates it, a brother or sister is in the darkness and walks around in darkness. They do not know where they're going because the darkness has what? They can't see. What is it in your life right now that's blinding you? Because it's going to take you away from God's word and we need to have that in our lives. And that is why, friends, I love life groups. And I know I say it all the time. But I love the fact that I have a group of men in my life that I can go to every single week. We meet consistently together. And they can encourage me. They can pray for me. All of those things are great. You know what I love most about my life group? They call me out on my stuff. All right? Because sometimes I, I have things in my life that I need somebody to point out to me. I call it the say it out loud test. If I go to somebody else who loves me, who knows me, who understands me, and I say it out loud to them, and they look at me like this, all right? I got a problem with that. And I know that I need that truth spoken in my life. A lot of these things, especially pride, are really hard to see in the mirror. Can we agree on that? Like, we might not think it's that bad or that big a deal, but when you say it out loud to somebody who loves you, who knows you and understands you, and they say, man, I don't think so, that's a problem. That's why life groups are so important. Have those relationships. You don't get that overnight. <laughs> it takes time. It takes consistency to have that in your life. Because here's the last one that we need to see with spiritual eyes. I must be committed. I must be committed. I've heard it said before that committing to God is saying yes and then saying, now what's the question? God gives you, you put your yes ahead of time before God even asks the question. And, and here's the thing I want you to understand about commitment. God doesn't need you to do anything. Did you know that? God doesn't need you to do anything. He's God. Now, he loves us, and it's his desire for his children to help him with things and to walk through that. But listen to what he says in 1 Samuel 15. He says, it, to obey is better than sacrifice. To obey and do what I ask you to do is better than sacrifice. I said this last week, but I want to go back to it. There's something about our human nature that always wants to try to put something between us and God. And it's been since the beginning of time, man has always tried to put something between me and God. When God raised up the nation of Israel and Moses led the children out of, the, out of Egypt and into the promised land, he took a stop at Mount Sinai, the holy mountain. And he parked them there and God said, listen, and you can read about this in Exodus. God said, listen, I'm going to speak. The actual voice of God is going to speak and is going to talk to your children and I'm going to tell you that. And what happened? They were absolutely afraid. They were terrified that God was talking to them. And so what the children of Israel said is, God, please, please don't talk to us anymore. Just talk to Moses. God, you talk to Moses, and then Moses will come, and then Moses will tell us what to say. We don't want to hear from you anymore because we're afraid of that. And that's what happened then. Now, that wasn't God's plan. God wanted us to hear directly from God when he set that up. And that didn't work. Because what happened is the Israelites went back and they followed their own wicked ways again. And so God came down with Jesus and put Jesus on the cross and, and freed that. And that's what it said when the Holy Spirit came, Jesus was able to create a way that we could have that direct pass to God again. God said, you don't longer have to wait for me. You have to just do exactly. You can come right straight to heaven. You can go have direct access to me. And God, God is so grateful for that. But what happened is, as natural people, as human beings, what we started doing is we started putting stuff between us and God again. So there was a, there's a mindset that I can't go directly to God, I have to go to the priest. And the priest is going to read God's word to me, and he's going to interpret for me, and he's going to give me the direction. 
And then a couple hundred years ago, there was a group of people who raised up and said, listen, you don't need a priest anymore. You can go straight to God. We, we can put God's word right in your hand. You can read it. You can understand it. And you can go straight to God. But I feel a lot of times right now in the church, I think the church has come back to that again in a lot of ways where I can't go straight to God anymore. I've got to instead have someone else go to God for me. Like I, I can't read the Bible and understand it myself. I've got to come to church and I've got to have the pastor read it to me and help me understand it. Or, or and, and if I get a little personal here, you know, I, I love like Christian Bible studies like Beth Moore, all that stuff. I read that stuff. I love that stuff. I think it's great. But it's never a substitute for being in God, directly in God's word. God has given us the ability to shine the light on his word and his truth. And we have direct access to God. We don't need to go through anyone else. We just need to understand and study his word and be committed to doing that. God has given us access to spiritual eyes. And we can get that by being in his word every single day. Now, I'm going to do something that you should not do in a message. I'm going to break the rules. Anybody okay with that? I'm a little bit of a, I like to push limits sometimes, all right? So what, I'm going to, what you're never supposed to do in a message is you're never supposed to leave the church hanging, right? We talked about the story with Elisha and the servant and the army surrounding Elisha and the servant, right? It's just the two of them. He gets his spiritual eyes open. I'm not going to tell you what happens in that story, all right? I want you to go, and I want you to go this week to 2 Kings 6, and I want you to read that for yourself. Now, it's only about five verses, okay? So I'm not giving you a homework assignment. But I want you to understand it because I want you to see with spiritual eyes. And here's my prayer for you guys. Psalm 118. And it'll be up on the screen. Let's go ahead and read this together. This has been the prayer that I've been praying for you guys throughout this message. Let's read it together. Open my eyes that I may see the wonderful things in your law. Open my eyes that I may see the wonderful things in your law. Friends, again, I don't know where you're at here today. And maybe some of you in this room, maybe for the very first time in your life, maybe you need to make that decision to commit to follow Jesus. Maybe it's something you've never done before, or maybe you thought you've done it, or maybe you've done it in the past, and you said, you know, today, I really want to commit to following Jesus. We want to give you a chance to do that here in a little bit. Or maybe there's something in your heart that God has stirred up that maybe you need to confess. Maybe there's something in your life that you just say, you know what, this is blocking me from God right now. There's, there's something that in my life that I really need to confess. We're going to have a prayer team that's going to come up here in a little bit, and they'll be up here to pray for you. We'd love to do that for you. You can call me. You can set up an appointment with me. We can talk about that. Let's take care of that. Let's clean up that sin. Or maybe here today for the very first time, you need to fully commit to God. And say, okay, I'm a follower of Jesus Christ, and I'm trying to do the best I can. But now I, I want to fully commit to maybe it's being in a life group. Maybe it's, maybe it's being in God's word. I, I pray, I'm so excited for those 19 people that have, have walked this journey with us through 40 days in the word. But my fear is that once it gets over, we'll stop. Let's not, let's not have it stop. Let's keep it going. Let's keep in God's word. Let's keep committed. Easter Sunday is going to be a wonderful opportunity for us as a church. It's going to be a chance for us to love on the community. People will come that we can come to, we can pray for, and we can support them. And, and I'm telling you, if you're part of this church and you haven't found a place yet, I, this is my example that I'm going to give. I want Easter Sunday to be like when you try something on. You know how you go to the store and you try it on before you buy it, right? You say, okay, how does this fit? Does this fit good? Do I want to commit to it? That's what I want Easter Sunday to be. Find some way that you can serve and you can commit to saying, hey, I want to try this shirt on. I want to see how it feels to, to run the video camera or I want to see how it feels to be part of the host team or, or maybe help out with coffee. Whatever that is, we'd love to have you connected with that so you can have that opportunity. And again, not because I need you to do something. All that stuff is going to happen whether you decide to do it or not. But God has given you an invitation to join him and to be a part of that. And my prayer, oh, my prayer is that we would see people with spiritual eyes. We would see them as God's children who are lost and separated from him and without the love of Jesus Christ, that's all we can do. They're gonna, we need to make those connections and build that with them. Let's pray. I'm gonna ask the prayer team to go ahead and come on up here while we're praying. God, in your spirit right now, I sense a heaviness. Um, 
And I don't know what that's about right now, but I, I know that you do, so I'm just gonna submit to your will. And I know that there, there's some stuff going on right now that needs your guidance, that needs your peace. I don't, I don't know what that is, but again, I just pray that, I just pray for those spiritual eyes, God. And every person in this room and everyone within the sound of my voice, whether they're watching online, that we would have our eyes open. And God, if there's someone here in this room who has never fully committed their life to you, let today be that day. Let us fully surrender to you. Let us give up that stubborn, selfish pride that got us in so much trouble when we were kids. And now here we are doing the same thing to our Heavenly Father. Help us to release that and be free. God, again, if there's something in any of our hearts, <coughs> jealous, bitterness, lust, anger, whatever that could be, God, break those walls down right now. Let us confess those things to one another and, and let us be free from that. Jesus, in two weeks, we're going to celebrate what you did for us on the cross. When you took all that guilt, you took all that shame, and you said those words, it is finished. And we can be free from that. And God, I know maybe there's someone here who just needs to, to, to make that commitment and to, and to be consistent in saying, this is my church home and, and I'm gonna do whatever it takes. I'm gonna use my God-given gifts to reach as many people as I possibly can, whatever that looks like, God. Jesus, I thank you for that privilege we have of being in your church. We thank you and we praise you and we ask all these things in the matchless name of Jesus Christ, our Lord. Amen.